Welcome sentient beings from all known universes and beyond. It's time to activate your cranial downlinks and prepare to receive a raft of discussion on a cosmic ocean of science fiction and fantasy topics, interviews with local area genre devotees, and insightful prognostication by our soothsayers of science fiction, our forecasters of fantasy, and any other beings that happen to get caught in our gravity well. This is the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. I'm Bill. I'm Linda. I'm John. Charles. I'm Seth. I'm Jenna. And tonight, we're very pleased to have with us a special guest, um, Professor Dan Clays. Um, Dan uh, received his PhD from Northwestern University in 1991, and then worked at the Fermi National Laboratory on the discovery of the top quark. He joined the University of Nebraska in 1996, where he serves as the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy and searches for new theoretically predicted particles at CERN, where the 2012 announcement of the Higgs boson was made. So, uh, Professor Clays, welcome very much to the show. We're happy to have you. Yes, Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Welcome. <laughs> so I think we'd like to start off with uh, your origin story. If you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you managed to get into physics, what kind of sparked your interest there. And uh, my guess off the top is that maybe it was comic books based on your background there, uh, background yeah. image, but I'll let you go ahead and talk to that. I'm, I'm happy to make exactly that connection. I, it, it may not be totally true that uh, my love for comic books are what led me to become a physicist. But I think it's absolutely true that from a very young age, um, when I got hooked on them, I, I, I just loved the science fiction elements. I loved the origin stories of those heroes, which usually was backed up with some kind of science. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. The explanations of their powers usually was scientific and the somehow almost magical sleight of hand by which they defeated their villains often involved some science. Mm -hmm. So from an early age, I think I always had this feeling that science was cool. Um, in grade school, being good in math mm -hmm. meant teachers encouraged me in a certain direction. Yeah. And when I discovered physics in high school, um, something that uses math so heavily, um, it was when I realized that's really where I wanted to go. Kind of a match made in heaven between math oh, yeah. and physics, right? That's right. <laughs> Well, okay, so you kind of do a lot of presentations on comic books and physics and how those two things intersect uh, and maybe what it's kind of what it would be like if that was real. If you can, if we can maybe just take kind of a step into the world of the comic book here and think about some of the different origin stories for some of the comic book heroes, um, that the origin stories that maybe have a, a basis in physics and maybe talk about some of those. I'm sure you probably have some favorites and maybe what we would expect if somebody in real life tried to get superpowers by taking, uh, by taking that particular tack. Okay. Um, let's just start because the example is pretty straightforward of okay. the really first comic book superhero, and that was Superman. Mm -hmm. if, if you remember in uh, 2013's Man of Steel with Henry Cavell as, as Superman, when he is testing the limits of his newfound ability, you'll remember what he's doing is he's crouching, straining, and then jumping. Yep, I remember he jumps that. Again and again and again, trying to get to greater heights. That's that's a beautiful homage to the original Golden Age 1938 Action Comics number one, when they actually explain Superman's ability to fly as as jumping with mm -hmm. super strength. Remember? Right, right. Um, it wasn't actually flying; it was jumping. Jump. 
tall buildings in a single bound. Right, exactly. Wasn't he portrayed more as like a circus strongman to the extreme rather than actually superhero per se in the original golden era? So, but he did, but bullets did bounce off of him. Yeah, uh, right. And within the first couple of years, he was exhibiting things like uh, telescopic vision, uh, x-ray vision, um, things that are a little bit more than uh, circus strongman sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But in, in, in the first few issues, they, the, he purportedly can jump. Well, they were not always consistent because as you read the first few issues, they talk about him jumping a 20-story building or a 10-story building or 40-story building. But I'll go with the 40 because if you look at the perspective of some of the drawings, some of the panels, it's clear that he's at least that high. <laughs> and in, in um, Action Comics number two, he hops up and alights atop the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. That thing is the same height as a 40-story building. Um, so when, when Jerry Siegel, the writer, and Joe Schuster, the artist, um, were doing that first few issues, um, the Equitable Building was a well-known skyscraper on the city landscape. And at 537 feet, it was, it was actually 40 stories tall. So I tend to think that's the building they had in mind. If that thing's 537 feet tall and he can jump it in a single bound, if you compare that to the Olympic record for a standing vertical leap, that's 5.4 feet. So Golden <laughs> Age Superman could jump 100 times higher than the Olympic record. Now, the way I bring physics into that is you'll remember in physics, you, you go beyond a little bit of uh, distance equals rate times time and you bring in acceleration and you start to talk about uh, the force of gravity. Um, you can write equations that can describe trajectory so you can figure out how fast you need to be leaving the ground to be able to clear a 537 foot obstacle. And you can calculate the force that would be required in a leap to do it. And I put those equations when I give this talk on Superman, we go through it in a few slides. I don't expect anybody to follow every line. I don't expect everyone to do much more than to say, oh yeah, 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 I remembered physics, you could do this sort of stuff. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. What we end up with a few slides later is that the force of his jump, he's got to exert with his legs 220, 1,930 newtons of force that comes out to about 50,000 pounds. Oh, the cool thing is, wow. if, you, if you look at the original description of Superman's <clears throat> line of ability of jumping, they say he could jump a 40-story building and leap an eighth of a mile. And if you take that same 50,000 pound force, rather than jumping straight up, you jump out, at a 45 degree angle, that's how you get maximum range. That turns out to be exactly one eighth of a mile, which tells me that Siegel and Schuster, who were just teenagers at the time, they remembered enough high school physics to get that part right. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Gotta make now, sure it's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if the physics work out like that, is it the biology that's wrong? If, if Superman can do that jump, should he look like a human being? That's an excellent question. Because in another talk, I talk about um, the cross-sectional strength of bone necessary to sustain weight or to, in fact, enact jumps. And at that time, I'm looking at Hulk and I'm looking at as the iconic example of a giant King Kong. Mm -hmm. um, and to be able to withstand the forces that we've just described to make that jump, um, Superman's structure would have to be substantially different than ours. <laughs> if his bones were to be able to sustain that, they'd have to be a lot thicker. Mm. And he would look a lot stouter than us, unless... Yeah, concrete. Unless he's just assembled a little bit differently than us. I could imagine... Uh, 
bones laced with carbon nanotubes, for example. Um, we, we've, first, we've got to recognize that since we are what we eat, and Clark Kent was raised in Smallville, Kansas, not too far away from Omaha or Lincoln, Nebraska. He's not <laughs> consuming anything much different than we do. Mm -hmm. He's just got to put it together a little bit differently, but he's a carbon life form, we're a carbon life form. Um, the other thing that I have talked about in some of my talks, and I admit I'm not a biologist, but if you compare the proportions of chemicals found in the human body to the proportions of chemical found in our environment, they don't match identically. And that's because of all the things we consume, our body metabolizes, metabolizes some of those elements, not others. Uh. There are some elements that are in trace quantities in our environment and found in trace quantities in our body, but not necessarily in the same ratios. In other words, we take what we need from the environment and put it to use. Mm -hmm. So I imagine, for example, that Superman utilizes some of those trace elements that are necessary for life, but perhaps in a different proportion or combination than we, and his cell structure is, as a consequence, stronger, and his, his bones are stronger. Like I said, if he took more carbon than we do, carbon is one of the main ingredients in our body, of course. Yeah. Um, but if he took it in higher quantities and he had his bones were uh, carbon nanotube laced throughout, then maybe he could have the proportions he has and still be able to exhibit the forces that he needs to, to do things like jump a 40 story building. But then his skin would have to be made of something completely different to be able to withstand the pressure of space or the vacuum of space. Well, a lot of bullet hitting it. That, that yeah. is also true. Yeah, maybe it's the same thing that allows him to, to do both. And then we're talking about biology, which is out of my range. But when I, if you look at the long list of chemicals in the human body, you, you know, we're 75% water. And that explains why Hydrogen and oxygen are among the top three, and then carbon is in there as well. And then there's a lot of clearly important chemicals that we don't always know exactly what they're there for, but you can find trace amounts of iron and copper, molybdenum and zinc, stuff like that, right? They're somehow mm -hmm. still essential. Um, in one of my talks, when I try to speculate on why kryptonite might be crippling to Superman or any Kryptonian, but doesn't seem to bother us much. Um, then I start speculating on what's unique about his physiology, what chemicals might he purpose in his body that might be susceptible to some forms of radiation that we don't rely upon so much. And just as an example, I thought of boron as a for instance. It's, we use very, very, very little of the boron in our environment, but, but we've got trace amounts of it. But there's a lot more boron there than we use. Our body does use it. It's a catalyst for RNA formation. It somehow clearly maintains the integrity of cell walls. They find in experiments with rats that without it, uh, the rats can't survive. Um, we also recognize for us in heavy doses, it's clearly poisonous. But boron also has a lot of industrial uses. Um, it's used in the semiconductor industry for doping. It enhances the thermal conductivity and electron mobility of, 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 of materials. It increases chemical stability and it even strengthens materials. Mm -hmm. So I like to postulate, for example, that maybe uh, an organic compound that uses it could give Kryptonian cells the ability to not only be stronger, but to do, I mentioned the semiconductor industry, maybe the ability to store solar energy like Superman purportedly does, right? He absorbs mm -hmm. solar energy, he stores it like a battery, and then when needed, he can call upon it. 
Or now, perhaps a, a, a stable isotope of boron we haven't discovered yet that's causing him to have these abilities. Perhaps. And boron, we already know, is an effect, an effective neutron sponge. It, 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 we use it um, to control otherwise runaway nuclear reactions. Mm -hmm. And when bombarded, it breaks up into lithium. Hmm. So I could imagine that neutron radiation, which we don't have a lot of natural sources here on Earth for us, it ordinarily wouldn't, wouldn't uh, harm him just being here on Earth, but um, it could break down somehow the storage to energy release mechanism that he relies on by just the mere exposure to something that's giving off neutrons. Since our phones use lithium batteries, are you thinking the same kind of principle? Yes. All right. So was it Superman specifically that got you thinking about the, the parallels in physics and, and using it as an example, or was there another a uh, superhero or um, comic book series that inspired you, but you just decided Superman was the most relatable to a lot of people. I I use every superhero I can think of, uh, when, depending on what physics I'm describing. And I think, mm -hmm. so I, I actually, before I went back and got my PhD, I taught high school physics. So mm -hmm. um, one way to keep the class entertained was to pull in uh, comic book characters uh, to talk about things. And of course, the moment I talk about gamma radiation, I had a big slide about, uh, about the Hulk. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I start my, so I've got a series of talks and Superman is the one I, is in lesson one because it's force and acceleration. So F equals MA, it sort of starts from the basics um, and is an origin story with which everyone is familiar. That's why I often start with Superman, but I talk, I talk about uh, uh, the Fantastic Four and the, their origin story, which came from exposure to radiation. So um, let, me, let me ask you about that, about the Fantastic Four. Okay. So, so they were exposed to cosmic radiation that changed their physical structure, right? Yeah. So you had... Uh, the torch, right? Uh, you had Mr. You Fantastic. The, torch? the, the human what? torch? The torch? Yeah. For a second, I thought you said porch. I was like, I don't no, remember no. that character. <laughs> yeah. No, he said I'll, torch. I'll tr try to enunciate <laughs> better the torch. Yeah. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, the porch. Girl. I like the porch. Yeah. yeah. You know. now, You'll never get past my screen door. I am the porch. We're going to get into some nerd arguing here. Sorry. Yes. About that. So, so let me ask you this. So they get exposed to cosmic radiation, right? <clears throat> what, is there a mechanism via that means that would guarantee that every cell in their body was changed and changed in the same way? So that, you know, Mr. Fantastic, he's got the ability to stretch he would, wouldn't every cell of his body have to have been impacted by a cosmic ray in the same way in order for all the cells to stretch or for that, the torch to flame on? That, 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 of course, is a fault of that explanation that I do point out when I talk about the origin of the Fantastic Four. As I mentioned, I think before we went on the air, I loved the Fantastic Four as a kid. Mm -hmm. And and I was excited when I got older and, and w did some experiments with cosmic rays because I had remembered reading as a kid that they got their powers from cosmic rays. If you, so what happened? So the Fantastic Four, they are a team of astronauts. They take off in a spaceship uh, that turns out to have inadequate shielding because unpredictably there is a series of solar flare eruptions, a giant cosmic ray storm that bathes their ship with cosmic rays many times a flux that's much higher than normal. 
but by the by the way, as you're as you're sitting there right now, you are cosmic rays are passing through you mm-hmm. right now all the time. Uh, they're they're they have their origins as free moving particles in space, usually protons. Their source is stars. Stars are big balls of what? Gas. And what kind of gas, primarily? Hydrogen. Yeah. Hydrogen. Simplest element, right? Hydrogen atoms have just a proton, and maybe a neutron, with an orbiting electron to balance the charge. In a hot star, they have disassociated just into free protons and electrons. And mm-hmm. neutrons. And every star off its surface is this f- free flowing, flowing gas uh, that we call a cosmic wind, it's just a stream of particles coming off of its surface all the time. Every time there's a flare, there's a, like somebody speaking too close to you and spraying you with this spittle. There's spittle <laughs> that comes from stars that yeah. spray out and, and bathe the earth. Right. No, every self being it. bombarded by sun spittle. And every time there's a a supernova, then we've got an extraordinarily high density of these particles flying through space with extraordinarily high energies. But right now, as you sit, if you look at uh, look at one of your fingernails, because every square centimeter, about the size of one of your fingernails, has on average a cosmic ray particle passing through it every minute. Mm. And if you look at the back of your hand and think of it as a big rectangle, that's something that is about uh, 24 square centimeters or about 150, 155 square centimeters. That means as you look at the back of your hand, cosmic ray, they're, they're actually muons. The particles that hit, that approach the earth, they strike the atmosphere they have collisions that spray particles down toward the earth. We get this little shower of particles that come down in, in a cascade. At the surface of the earth, there's a lot of them are muons. And every minute on average, a muon is going to pass through each of your fingernails. The back of your hand, probably two or three of them every second. And your entire body exposure is several depending on which how much of your surface is facing the sky if you're standing or laying down but at any given time hundreds if not thousands of cosmic ray muons are passing through your body now they do that harmlessly and that's because cosmic rays whether they're the protons in deep space or the electrons and muons that are here at the surface of the earth they're subatomic, so they are smaller than atoms, and they're a lot smaller than the space between atoms. Most of those cosmic rays pass through our body harmlessly, I promise. Um, <laughs> if, if this is going to bother you, I should point out that thousands of times a second, spontaneous decay of trace radioactive elements in your body are producing radiation that goes outward, but passes through your body as well. Yeah. Hmm. On, on average, 3% of your body is mutated. Right now, the <laughs> cells in your body are mutated. It doesn't mean anything. It, it's not important. It's the, so, the, I'm finding myself then severely disappointed that I have not become a mutant yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically you are. It's just, you know, you don't really have superpowers. Son of a bitch. But you can wake up like I do, hopeful every morning. Yeah, right. maybe today will be the day. Yeah. There, there isn't a nerd alive who's read comic books who doesn't just like hope that they'll get that special cosmic ray. <laughs> yeah, I'll go, I'll go roll around in toxic waste if you know if I, if I get if it'll hard, work. If it'll work, you know, I'll give it a shot. But I mean, your argument is like, I, I actually like to argue with people that think like the CERN Collider is going to cause a black hole that's going to eat the Earth. And I just tell them there are higher intensity collisions of particles in the atmosphere. 
than there right. are in the CERN Collider. It's, it's not going to happen, but you know, people want to believe what they want to believe. Of course. So it was, it was mentioned that accumulated over our lifetime, all of us have some mutated cells. It's one of the causes as we grow older of, of various cancers as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. But, but most, of, most of the mutations that happen in cells in your body uh, aren't going to be replicated body-wide. The, the question that you, know, you first raised on this particular topic was mm -hmm. uh, Human Torch, Mr. Fantastic, The Thing, Invisible Woman, all of their cells have been mutated in the same way. Right. The mutations that you have accumulated, you may have a handful of them, they're, you know, completely different from cell to cell and in completely different organs of your body. Uh, most mutations, probably 98% of them are completely neutral. Yeah, they don't do they anything. have yeah. no, no discernible function or, or anything that you'd observe. Uh, I guess the things you worry about is how often might they be harmful? And that's the, the cancers that I just described. Yeah. How often might they be spectacularly useful? Uh, we don't see that much. <laughs> it depends on the environment and what the environment determines to be useful in all honesty, but it's like, uh, so like the human torch, his mutation, what you're saying is every cell in his body had to mutate at the same time in the same way. That's right. Uh, otherwise this wouldn't work. And, and and an established born creature, your genome is fairly set. So it not only had to change every cell in his body, it had to change like the RNA to actually. It, it, had, to, it had to strike the same part of the DNA in every cell. Yeah. And then you, you had to, the, the, your body had to have a way of replicating that so that you keep having that. It's like rather than like if so as every new cells cell mutated created. in his body and all of a sudden he had superpowers. His body should be replacing cells and by the normal matrix that he has. So he, like Johnny Storm, should turn back into Johnny Storm after a while, but he does not. So not only every cell is probably mutating the same time, the same way, but his body has to replicate this mutation in all future cells. We could we could speculate that some stem cell technology could be developed to protect astronauts in space from the cancers you would expect them to develop uh, as they travel. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that could do the replication body-wide. But of course, there's nothing that complicated in, in Fantastic Four number one. Oh, no. <laughs> and that, that came out in 1961. Nobody's thinking about that stuff anyway. Well, yeah. that, but, that was the kind of the classic wild science fiction where they're like, we don't know what, we aren't really sure what, uh, well, we know what radiation can do. But hey, maybe just sometimes it gives you superpowers was also kind of a popular kind of genre trope back then. So radiation is the MacGuffin that comic books use to explain all the superpowers. I mean, not always. The, uh, the agent, there's always a delta, there's always a change force that, ex that they use to explain these certain powers that others get. A lot of it's radiation, but it's like, and it's a handy MacGuffin. It truly is. Well, you, you, may, you may remember when you were little, um, that there was on the market gamma irradiated seeds that you could buy. I remember that. And they, they've known since, you know, well over a hundred years ago, I think in 1909, there was a study about the um, radiation from radium on plants. So they grew plants close to a, source of radium and depending on the day's exposure they documented in photographs how poorly the plants did you could you could kill plants off you could clearly stunt their growth mm -hmm. um, 
but as they studied the sorts of things, they also started studying exposure to seeds. And they discovered as clearly detrimental as radiation could be to life forms, the mutations that result once in a great while could actually do something spectacular. So there was this fast growing high yield peanut that, that was created by the plant have, that produced the, the seeds for the new plant having been exposed earlier. And this created a new industry of super seeds. They exposed germinating plants long before CRISPR, you know, where they could isolate sure. and move snippets of genetic material around. Scientists were just bombarding huge numbers of seeds with radiation. And, and a lot of the times what they ended up with is nothing, nothing worth writing home about. <laughs> the, 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 the seeds would be impotent. The, you'd be able to grow nothing. What you'd grow would be deformed. Maybe no fruit would be born. But once in a while, they'd find these random spectacular seeds that had a desirable characteristic. And this is, in fact, um, how the star ruby red grapefruit mm. was made. Most of the peppermint today that makes almost all the world's menthol and mint oil and stuff like that comes huh. from the Todd Beecham peppermint plant. And that was produced by radiation. And I also just see a bunch of kids like getting these uh, irradiated seeds, like maybe this one will turn into like a monster plant, a la Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and important to us here in Nebraska, uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of super sweet corn varieties that have their origin in these experiments decades ago. Huh. So, so that, that was, those sorts of discoveries were 50s, uh, 1950s some stuff still in the early 60s. So in 1961, when Stanley and Jack Kirby created the Fantastic Four, that was sort of the zeitgeist that mm -hmm. um, there were, I mean, if you overlook all the bad stuff that exposure to radiation can do, and which is in fact far more prevalent, there is this <laughs> chance of a mutation that, that could be beneficial. Now, I'm going to ask if you're familiar with a particular superhero. My guess is that you may be because this superhero in his real life identity, he was a physicist and his, his character name, Phil Selensky, and he was known as Dr. Solar. And he had the ability to, I think, touch a material and change it into one element heavier, I think, than what it was, right? You're, you're, think, you're thinking of one particular story. That wasn't a normal power that he ah. had. Uh, yes, yes, I did read Dr. Solar. Dr. Solar uh, attracted every kid at, on the new, at the newsstand because they had these beautiful painted covers every month, uh. um, highly realistic looking. <laughs> and... Um, and yeah, so so there there was I forget what issue it was, but it was called Midas Solar's Midas Touch, mm. and in a a freak accident that happens at Adam Valley, a lot like the freak accident that created Doctor Solar in the first place. Uh, there's a control rod breaks, their nuclear py piles starts to overheat. Solar runs down there to slide some rods back in place to bring everything under control. And the additional exposure to the radiation there uh, enriches his power. And the, the, the thing he discovers when he comes back is, yeah, everything he touches, uh, he changes its element because he, they don't explain where they come from, but he, touches things and he gives every atom in that object an extra proton. Wow. So he bumps them up on the periodic table. Uh, that would be that so was, cool. That was cool to me because that was like the first <laughs> lesson I had in chemistry. Like reading that story was my introduction to the periodic table. And this idea that you could, you know, uh, bump things up progressively to different elements was, was, was fascinating to me. 
Yeah, I remember yeah. that story very, very well. Time. Right, the <laughs> alchemy aspect. I mean, so did not only the superhero stories maybe attracted you, did you were you ever attracted to like stories of alchemy and what that could like just what they were trying to do which was basically a very crude understanding of physics in many ways yes absolutely i mean even isaac newton was interested in alchemy i think everyone was like if you can make gold out of you know something more valuable out of something that wasn't quite as valuable and and they didn't have the stock market so obviously that was the next best thing if they could figure it out right now what about superheroes like the ant-man or others like that that can shrink themselves down to subatomic level how would that work so how are they though- breathing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I have to admit, since the Ant-Man movies came out, I've been telling myself I have to prepare a talk on the Ant-Man. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't done it yet. Oh, okay. Ant- Ant-Man, Ant-Man presents a lot of problems. <laughs> yes. Um, because when, when he reduces himself in size, um, he doesn't lose molecules in doing it. He doesn't seem to lose anything, right? He all see, he's complete, right. he's still there. Yeah. Which means the size has changed. Do you, did you ever see, um, when Star Trek went off the air, there was a animated series. Yes. And one of the episodes was, they passed through some nebula. I don't, I have to find this episode again. They pass through a nebula or something. They get some exposure to something. And the crew all start slowly. They don't realize it at first, but they start to shrink. You know, their clothes, clothing gets loose. Uh, They don't fit in the chair so well. Something's out of reach that they... So just biological matter shrinking. That's right. Okay. And... Spock eventually explains what's going on. He doesn't explain why or how, yeah. but it's the DNA is coiling tighter. <laughs> By having the DNA coil tighter, oh, every yeah. one of their cells is shrinking. <laughs> and there will be a minimum size that they achieve. Uh, uh, they won't get to the quantum realm, I guess. But um, so I, I, have to, I have to give that a little more thought. So I have to find that episode of the animated series of Star Trek. And... Uh, Listen to that explanation again. Yeah. See if there's some some way we can resurrect it. Apply that to Ant Man. Yeah. Well, Ant Man, like the reason his shrinking and or growing work is through the application of him particles, quote unquote. Yes. So there's some elementary or complex particle that Dr. Pym discovered that has this effect on size. This interests me very greatly because I am, after all, a particle physicist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe we can direct CERN's attention to look for those PIM <laughs> particles. <laughs> Which he seems to generate profusely when he needs, he needs them, right? So, right. Uh, well, and it seems to work both ways, right? Because not only can he shrink down to subatomic level, but then shrink back to full size. Yeah. And particles are just dark matter. It would be a terrible MacGuffin if he couldn't make lots of it when he needed it. <laughs> Good point. <clears throat> well, are there any other superheroes that uh, you can think of that have interesting ways of getting their powers that would, you know, kill a normal person if they were to try it? I mean, we have like oh. Spider-Man, right, who got bit by a radioactive spider, for example. How, how would that work? So I can't explain <laughs> the origin of all of these heroes. It's, right. If, if we just go back to the Fantastic Four. Sure. Yeah. So I, I started talking about how we are all being exposed to cosmic rays, even as we speak all the time, and it right. hasn't done much that we've noticed. But the Fantastic Four, they pass through the Van Allen radiation belts. Mm-hmm. And they're the 
flux of cosmic rays is much higher. Then they're there during a cosmic storm. So I guess the radiation levels were tens or thousands of times more intense. Uh, there could, we've got about 75 trillion cells in our body. And if we wanted to imagine the Fantastic Four being bathed in cosmic rays, sufficient in quantity to administer a full body dose, you could do this quick calculation. You could look at the number of cells in the body and divide it by, see a thousand times a second is the exposure our bodies have here on Earth in the Van Allen radiation belts. That's about 15 million per second. It would take, five million seconds of exposure to give them to have 75 trillion cosmic rays pass through their body. That's eight weeks a day and another hour or so. Um, but it, you know, it just took a couple of panels in the comic book. But then the cosmic ray storm came. Okay, so tens of thousands of times more intense. So maybe in a few minutes, they could be exposed. The problem, as you brought up earlier in the program today is, every cell in their body has to be mutated. And just because 75 trillion cosmic rays passed through your body of 75 trillion cells does not even mean that every cell in your body had a cosmic ray pass through it. Because yeah. just Poisson statistics tell us that some will be hit, hit more than once yeah. and some will be missed entirely. And the Poisson statistics would tell you something like 36% of your cells would have been missed entirely, zero hits. And mm -hmm. another 36 or 37 percent would have been hit once, but about 18 percent will be hit twice, six percent will be hit three times, another percent or two will be hit four times. There's no way every cell has been hit once. And as I mentioned earlier anyway, most of these cosmic rays pass in the space between atoms and go through your body doing little more than tickling the electrons of the atoms they pass by. And we had already pointed out that there'd be a particular point in the DNA that would have to be hit identically every time for that to happen. Um, there is, there, 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 it is possible that a cosmic ray might induce a mutation that would guarantee to affect the entire human body. Hmm. Can you think? Well, isn't that what cancer is? Ah, that doesn't affect every cell in the body. Yeah. Well, when they die. You'd have to change you, you, the yeah. DNA okay. code It'll affect every cell in the body that, right? eventually in that way, yes. Okay. So it's, what it's if it... back to the, the mutations have to be all, just touching <clears throat> the cell doesn't mean mutation. And all the mutations have to be the same. Yeah. Uh, what if it hit a stem so cell? DNA. You'd have to change the DNA that is telling you how to recreate the cell, oh, yeah. right? That's the but best way to get it throughout the entire body. So the RNA, at least. If it changed the, the stem cell, would that? I'll even, go, I'll even go simpler than that. If it passed through an embryonic stage. Oh. When, when we only were a cell or two. Oh. That's the sort of time when you could get a mutation that would affect exactly. the whole body. And of course- That organism can't mutate, but one in that, that what, bio, bioplast stage could probably do that. Yeah. So you're saying I missed my window is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you could still create aliens though, Seth. To, that's, what we're, that's what I'm hearing. You could start like changing animals in the embryonic stage to how something old are you, very cool. How old are you, Seth? 38? So beyond uh, the embryonic eight, stage. 38 <laughs> years and nine months ago, that's oh, when beyond. you blew your window. <laughs> anyway, if you look back at the original tagline on yeah. the X-Men comic book, the X-Men were described as children of the atom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if you look at any of the origin stories of the individual X-Men, most of them will uh, had parents that uh, either were exposed to radiation or worked in mm -hmm. nuclear labs or were mm -hmm. astronauts, things like huh. that. Um, 
that, that's, that's a lot like the supersedes that I talked about, a mutation that's done um, either to the plant that produced the seed or in the X-Men's case to the parents that produced the progeny. Um, th those are the sorts of, not that I expect any of the mutations shown in the <laughs> X-Men comic book to be likely to happen, but- um, It's plausible. It's, it's a plausible fun. story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What so it sounds most it, of the mutants in the X Men universe, the, a preponderance of them turn blue. Why do they turn blue? Hmm. Well, could it have been um, like uh, they got hit with like tachyon particles that traveled back in time and then got them as an embryo? I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm guessing that the mutants in X Men turn blue because blue shows up really well. Uh, I, I imagine it is an ink uh, deal, but it's like, I don't, it always bothered me. There should be some, if so many of them are going to be blue, this, the comics should make some kind of connection for me to explain that. Good point. Do you know of any? <laughs> no. <laughs> if you, if well. you, look at, you look at mutations in, so, so there's a lot of, naturally occurring mutations that turn out to be due to a real simple uh, swap in the DNA chain or a miscopy in the DNA or a dislocation by one uh, that result in things like uh, multi-limbed frogs and um, Crustaceans like lobsters that are all different colors, including blue. I mm. just brought that up because it had blue in it. So, <laughs> do you think with the popularity of comic books, we uh, school systems are missing a really great opportunity to revamp their their programming to one make kids more literate by bringing them reading material, and two. Uh, engaging these very real scientific thoughts and principles, and even though that obviously comic books are, you know, bending the rules, still get using it as a chance to pull them in early, uh, boys and girls, to these topics mm -hmm. and technology and science and DNA yeah. and chemistry, all these different things that uh, we should really get over ourselves and and let them embrace the bandwagon if it means it's going to improve their science uh, literacy. I, I absolutely agree. And mm -hmm. when I talk, I sometimes go to grade schools, junior highs, high schools, and give these comic book talks. Um, I certainly make that connection with the science teachers. Are they pretty receptive or do you think, do, or do they ever tell you like, man, I wish I could, I tried to do this, but being a high school or grade school level, they don't like me stepping away from the books. So you mu it must be really nice that you can make your own class because you've got that freedom to do that. There, it's not, so, so it is true that with prescribed material that must be taught, that it's difficult to be flexible as a grade school, middle school, high school teacher, because um, you don't want to accidentally leave something out. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason you can't teach the same material using different examples. So, it's still it's still possible to make connections like this. Well, there's a chemistry professor at UNO who is using um, extraterrestrials and ghosts as a format for him to explain uh, physical and chemical processes to students, and the class is wildly popular. I love so it. They come for the ghosts and they stay for the the science, and it's like <laughs> I like that. I mean, those were always my favorite professors in school is the ones who took, who applied the material to subjects that I cared about, as opposed to just like teaching yeah. the state, just straight equations. But it's, it becomes much more fun when you apply it to the real world, when you've got a chemistry 
uh, chemistry teacher who will show you the fun things that you can do with chemistry without, you know, setting your own house on fire. I've been approached by, I think it's the Success Academy at UNO to do a anthropology of UFOs class because I, I actually have textbooks lined up and everything. And it's, I, I think it'll be fun. But it'll bring kids in. And I, it's like I told my dean, if you want students, let me teach my UFO class because you'll have if, – if, if it's all about numbers in the academic system right now, I can give you the numbers. So, yeah. And it's like as that chemistry professor found out, it's a draw. They come. They will come. Have you ever used this to teach, uh, professor? So I, 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 from time to time, I, of course – Pull in examples rather than having a, a sliding block down an incline or, or, or some boring such thing. I try to try to spice it up a little bit with examples that come from comic book events or comic book characters. Um, when, when I when I go to cons and talk about comic book physics, um, I get lots of people who come up excited afterwards, either to say. Uh, I wish I would have taken more physics or I'm going to go take some physics now. And <laughs> with younger kids saying, oh, I'm absolutely going to go take physics now. So uh, that always feels good. So did someone draw you into the Comic-Con scene or did you like happen to see an advertisement for panels at a particular con and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to see what they say and put in a proposal. I just, I just put in a proposal. That's awesome I mean, that you did that. I, I did it. I did it once when Krypton Comics in Omaha for a free comic book day was was doing things in some of the open space uh, next to their uh, store, and I I had pitched a proposal there that I uh, that I do uh, uh, some comic book physics. I did a I did maybe five or six little fifteen minute things, um, and from that I put together you know, half hour talks and 50 minute talks for different venues. And uh, now I've probably given 80 talks or something on comic book physics. And That's you, awesome. You've been to Constellation, which is a, a, a smaller comic con yes. or a small, yes. smaller convention in Lincoln. That's usually in April. You've been there several years running. And, 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 and I was, and I was scheduled to be there oh. uh, this, this spring, but. That's one of my favorites. I love going there every year. And I think I've caught a couple of your panels, actually. Ah, very likely, because I've done it several times there. Have you, what is the biggest con you've done? The biggest one I've done is Planet Comic Con in, in Kansas City. That's I, awesome. That's a great con. Are, are you finding more and more that it's become popular with the superhero movies, or do you think oh, it was already on? the rise, what you were doing is just striking a chord. Yeah, so the movies have certainly raised uh, the visibility of, of, of comic book characters and um, gotten me a lot more invitations, I think, to talk to all sorts of civic groups all over the state. What's your, yeah. like, your next topic that you really wanna try and flesh out that you think will be a lot of fun? Is it Ant-Man or is it some other uh, comic book character or scenario that mm. you're looking forward to creating some new material with? So, so the, the talk that I was going to give at Comic, Comic, Planet Comic Con in Kansas City um, this spring, and what I would have been talking about at Constellation was time travel. That's, oh. that, that's, that's one that I am reworking that talk, so hopefully make it even better when I finally get the chance to give it. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Ant-Man's in the back of my mind because there's uh, some interesting physics there to be discussed. Well, we'd love to have you back on at some point to talk about time travel if, 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 if you're up for it. Uh, I, sure. Okay. Fine. We, we end up talking about time travel quite a bit here. It's yeah. one of our favorite topics, so we'd love to have you on to chat about it. Um, I, do have a, I do have another question for you, though. Um, okay. With your love of the comics and superheroes, I'm sure you've thought about it. If you had your choice of one superpower, what would you what would you choose? <laughs> well, a cheat would be to say I want 
Silver Surfer's cosmic power because then I can do absolutely <laughs> anything. But 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 as far but as far as like uh, a particular power that everybody recognizes, I think being able to fly would be would be wonderful. Mm. Yeah, you take that over teleporting. I, w I worry about teleporting. How far I could teleport without seeing? Yeah, right. The location where I'm gonna. Material, Good point. right? Did you, right. did you say flying? Yes. Well, I mean, don't I, I? I, if you fly, have you met people? They'll like shoot at you because <laughs> just because they just because they can because they're dicks. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they shoot at drones. They, yeah. They, they, yeah. yeah. John's Gee, brother, are, the the drones are often trying to look in the windows. So, <laughs> well, there's drones that. are naysayer. I, there I, are many, many drones that aren't spying on you. I, I'm with you, Professor. I would definitely go with flying, just because, like, the sensation would be so so much fun. I was thinking Same uh, myself. I would kind of think uh, teleporting, because I'd like to be able. You know, if somebody came up in front of me and. To confront me, I could teleport right behind them, you know, kind of freak them out, and they couldn't follow me. I could just jump here, there, there, and really of fast. Course, of course, you would use your power to practice to use <laughs> practical, practical jokes. Practical jokes. Well, I'd want to be invisible because then I could be in any room, listen to any conversation, get all kinds of interesting facts. <laughs> but could you only be invisible if you were naked? No, no, no. no, no let's not, not go there. That's not my invisibility. <laughs> but oh. What? What we're getting at is that most of the people on this podcast would abuse their powers should they get there. Yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> just, to, just as if I owned a lightsaber, I would be armless in about 15 minutes. <laughs> that's, that's, this is just how this, yes, Jenna, of course. Jenna, what's your superpower? For uh, practicality's sake, I think I would either go with uh duplication so i could like duplicate material objects so a hundred dollar mm. bill turns into you know fifty hundred dollar bills <laughs> or fifty thousand hundred dollar bills um uh, or mind reading they right. all have the same serial number not mind reading if you're using cash they're not checking that i'm not putting it in the bank right not mind reading jenna <laughs> all right linda how or about if you I duplicate diamonds or duplicate diamonds don't have serial numbers Good point. Well, no, how about you? What would your I've, superpower I've be? I've always said flying. So flying. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> to fly. Got a good so, shot. So we got three for flying. John, you just said invisibility. Yeah. All right, Charles, how about you? What's your superpower? I think as a kid, I always went with mind reading, but uh, uh, like, you know, but um, I don't know. I'd take any one of them probably. Would you want to be the torch? <laughs> well, not, not, not if it came to disfigurement. <laughs> Good point. Well, he's not, he's not disfigured, right? Yeah, usually usually uh, the human the human torch is immune to fire. So <laughs> and and the beauty about being the torch is you can also fly. Well, I I just think mind reading you'd learn a lot of things about people that you don't want to know. I don't oh, know. Then why do it? <laughs> or that's, if that's your power, yeah. All of a sudden, you you know someone that look. I'm not, I'm not in my department. Thing. There's a guy named Dean Manley. I know exactly enough about Dean Manley that I'm very happy with the level of our relationship. I don't want to know any more about Dean Manley because if I know anything more about Dean Manley, I might, I, it might be bad. It might make me sad. Everything I know about him is good. He's a very nice guy. Hey, that's it. If you read minds, all of a sudden, I'm just the saying, set ideas you have about people are going to change. Like the rest of you, I, I would go for a nice practical superpower. No. Like like what? I'm just saying the flying thing there. You know, there was there was one Twilight Zone episode that I remember, um, where um, the uh, guy got the ability to read minds, and there was a woman that worked in the bank that <clears throat> every now and then she'd have this fantasy about how she was going to rob the bank and take all this oh, money. I remember home. that one. Remember that one? Yeah. And uh, that's good. So 
can you hit mute there, Lynn? I think I'm echoing too much. And then, um, so he heard her, but he didn't know that it was her recurring fantasy of doing this. And he thought it was an actual plan. And so he reported her to the bank security. And so at the end of the day, when she went up to leave, they grabbed her and arrested her and went through her stuff. And, and they, and, you know, she's like, you know, what, what made you think of this? And, or, you know, whatever. And, and uh, he said, well, I, I, I sense that you were planning to do this. And she said, well, that's just a secret fantasy of mine that I've always had. How would you, how could you possibly have known that? And of course he couldn't tell her, you know, but it was kind of weird. So if you had the ability to read minds, you'd never know if what you were reading maybe was true or not. I don't know. So the, uh, ta- we were, we're, we talked a lot about the Fantastic Four and I've always thought that the member of the Fantastic Four who had the best power was Sue Storm, the invisible woman. Invisibility, that's what I'm no, talking about. No, no. She has the ability to bend light around her and she can also use that to generate force fields. Right, right. Which true. act a whole lot like telekinesis and she can use them in any number of ways. Well, yeah. That's, that's, I, you didn't, you asked me what superpower I wanted, but not what mechanism I wanted to generate that superpower. Hey, so, we're talking about science, so sometimes it's the science of how you become invisible. And Sue Storm's got one of the best. Yeah, well, uh, oh, yeah. There's a really good series that was on sci fi for a couple seasons that, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. It was called The Invisible Man. And the whole logic behind his ability to turn invisible was a science experiment where they put a gland in his like skull that could produce a uh, like a liquid that would cover his whole body so the light bent around him. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was like he could cause like by putting this liquid on other objects, light to bend around them and they turn invisible. And it was done in like I think. God, the late 90s, early 2000s, and it was pretty well done for the time. And uh, to tie with cryptozoology, uh, one episode they actually insinuated that it came from, um, God, uh, Bigfoot. Because the whole reason we can never find Bigfoot is because it that there is an organic origin to this gland, and they had happened to find it in uh, a species of animal that had developed it in order to avoid humans. Ah, interesting. And yeah. so I'm assuming that that he was able to make his clothes part of the invisibility. Yeah. yeah. That was the one thing, that was the one problem I had with the original Invisible Man was that he had to wear clothes or, you know, those face bandages in order to be seen. And he would mm-hmm. have to disrobe every time he wanted to be invisible, which seemed like a horrible way to have to go through the world totally naked in order to just to be invisible and go do stuff. It seems like... I- that would be prone to problems to getting I mean, injured easily. It makes sense it, if it's an innate ability. Then it was a the horror story. wouldn't have that innate ability. Like the horror that wasn't portrayed originally as a good thing. It was his curse. Like it wasn't a superpower for right, the original right. story. It was uh, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. it phoned me. <laughs> sort of like being the thing. I mean. Yeah. Of all the Fantastic Four members, that would have to be the most horrible transformation of all. Because who wants to be like a rock thing? I mean, that, yeah, that's kind of the arc of his story. Yeah, I know, but. The sadness of the, of the thing, yeah. So, Doctor, what, um, I know they've rescheduled Planet Comic Con tentatively for August, I think. Um, do you have any events or talks coming up that we can, you know, fly, uh, promote for you? Or will you let us know when your next uh, talk is so we can make sure we get the word out to everyone? I, I, thank you. Yes, I'd be glad to do that. And, and I, I, I will be at Planet Comic Con in August. if Nice. Excellent. Um, but the schedule hasn't come out yet. So. Okay. Are you going to be doing your time travel talk there? Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely reach out to us and we'll put it up on the page. Okay, thank you. All right. Can I ask you a question about time travel? Okay. Can you travel to the future? Because if there's a future to travel to, doesn't that mean free will doesn't exist? Because if you can travel to the future, then the future's already there. And it's like, if, if you can go there, 
that means everything's set in stone and there's really nothing you can do. Doesn't it depend on how you travel to the future? Because if you're going through a portal, then yes. But if you're just simply being put in cryostasis and time is passing around you at normal rate, but you're in that stasis and you just get to the future eventually. Or if you're in the yeah, vicinity of a black wake up, hole. When you wake up, it's not the future. It's now. It is. It, you're, you can never escape the now. Sorry, yeah, I interrupted right. his question or your answer to his question because I'm I just highlighting there's two different ways to get to the future. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're traveling to the future right now at one second a second. But it's like, I, I can never leave the now. If I can leave the now and go into the future, does that mean the future is already established? And in that case, is there any uh, free will at all? So that is, that's, that's an excellent question. And it, it depends on what our universe is like. This part we don't know. There's a phrase that describes the kind of universe you refer to when you think of a future that you can travel to and back from, and that's called a block universe. That at the moment the universe was created, um, everything was in some sense set in stone. That so we're just echoes reverberating through the halls of time and not really any kind of a time block energy. universe, yes. We never affect our environment because this is all decided before it ever happened. What, what are the other options or options? Well, the other option is that time evolves and the past is no longer there and the future isn't determined yet. Which, uh, which version do you like? <laughs> so you mentioned there's several time, ways to travel into the future and there it is absolutely possible for you to travel in the future by traveling at close to the speed of light where time slows down your local time slows down and you age very slowly and you come to some point in the future and You've, you've left your former present way behind. Uh, you didn't age much, and you have found yourself in the future. But that, that's different than the block universe kind of future that says there is a future fixed in four-dimensional space-time, um, locked in stone somehow, that you, um, that you can travel to and back. Not only does that raise a question about free will, it suggests that by moving into the future, that was already a predetermined act of yours, and that there's no way you can move future or past and change anything. Mm. Or wherever you go, that's what you were destined to do. You're part of the, the cog, and what so, you thought you were doing is, is really, it just is. So wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Linda. All right. Well, time travel always gives me a headache. <laughs> Our hour well, we'll is definitely up. have to have uh, Professor Clay's back to talk about his <laughs> yes. time travel with us on a future episode. I would mm -hmm. love that. I'd love to awesome. talk uh, other science fiction tropes if he's interested. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking Star Trek. I'd love to talk. Fa like faster than light travel if like what sort of ideas on that i love i love talking about that sort of stuff also which which, Force which fields, star drive is lasers. better which star drive is better there uh millennium falcons or the enterprises not the now <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying for the next one. Our hour for the future for the future <laughs> all right well sounds good well Professor Clays, thank you very much for joining us for this episode. We appreciate thank you it. Thank for the invitation, and I had a good time. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Take we'd care. love to have Thanks. you back. So thank you very much, and thank you all for watching. We will catch you on the well, next episode. But before that, we go, we yeah. need to shout out to the Sin Nation. Our the Synergy Nation, S-Y-N. Yeah, S-Y-N Nation.com. 
They're a uh, group of a group that's uh, of podcasters that are supporting each other. And so go check out the site sinnation.net, s y n nation.net, and there's a bunch of different podcast groups on there. Check them out. They all have uh, sort of a different flavor, different feel to them. So check them out. See what's out there. And um, we hope you guys will join us for our next show. We're going to be talking about a couple of new series that are out uh, on. Um, Amazon, uh, Upload, and Tales from the Loop, uh, probably amongst other things. So thank you all for watching, and we will catch you all next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. For more information and past episodes, please visit our website at galacticdriftwood.space or subscribe to us on YouTube. And now, please deactivate your cranial downlinks, collect your towels, and be sure to watch your step as you exit our gravity well.